Um, with that, I'll introduce Joan. And I didn't catch us up, but I'm on time. So, <laughs> um, Joan Leary Matthews is the director of the Clean Water Division at Region 2 of EPA, which uh, is New York, New Jersey, Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico, which I guess means sometimes they get to go down there. <laughs> and um, she works with Judith Hank, the regional administrator, who uh, has been worked for the state for years, and um, somebody I'm pleased I know a little bit. And uh, someone else who's coming has been involved working with, with them in various ways, Jim Tierney from, this, from DEC. He'll be here later. And Joan is an attorney. She uh, has taught law at Albany Law School. She worked for the New York State Attorney General's Office and I think more recently for New York State DEC. And uh, she's now at the regional office of EPA uh, heading up all, the whole water program. And we're very pleased to have her here. And she's going to give us an update on water issues from EPA's perspective. And um, thank you very much for coming. So. That's fine. I like the backdrop. It's, it's nice to look at, and it shows what we're all fighting for, right? So good morning, everybody. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you, and, and thank you so much, uh, Simon and Maureen, for inviting me. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined by my colleague today, uh, Janice Whitney. Janice, she's taking some photos. Uh, so Janice is our Water Sense Coordinator uh, for EPA Region 2. She has a table outside about the Water Sense program, so please stop by, talk to Janice, uh, get some information. I'll talk more about the Water Sense program at the end of my remarks, and I'll have a nice uh, announcement to make about that too. It's a real thrill to be here. Uh, in the FDR library. Uh, I think some of you attended our conference earlier this year on women and the environment. Uh, it was important to reflect on the contribution that Eleanor Roosevelt made to our nation's environment. It was really a wonderful event, as this one no doubt will be, too. It's a very active and exciting time at EPA. We are really cranking on so many fronts. And we're tackling the issues we face in water and air and land and, of course, climate change. So all of these topics will be uh, uh, I will touch on uh, a little bit today. And there are so many topics to discuss, but this morning I'll, I'll touch on a few. And there's a theme to these topics. And the theme is that to face new challenges and continue to provide safe, reliable drinking water to people, we have to focus on each step from source to tap. We can't afford to look at water issues in isolation. Protecting water is a lot like raising a child. You can't just show up in your child's late teens and expect them to be healthy. Though I have to tell you, in my house, I could have skip those teenage years. <laughs> We're on the other end of it now. It's so much nicer. Uh, you have to nurture these children from the very beginning and set them up to be safe and healthy their whole lives. And with more extreme weather across the country, it's more important than ever that we protect our water resources. Did you know that today is the third anniversary of Superstorm Sandy? So uh, it's it's you know, a really time for all of us to reflect. I mean, such devastation, such loss of lives, uh, really bringing home to us how important our infrastructure is and resilience. So, uh, so some of the topics that I will touch on today are, uh, very briefly, two recent EPA rules, resilience investments after Sandy, infrastructure investments, source water protection, the New York City Filtration Avoidance Determination, uh, the EPA Trash Free Waters Effort, and EPA's Water Sense Program. So turning to the Clean Water Rule, this May, EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers finalized the Clean Water Rule to protect the streams and wetlands that one in three Americans rely on for drinking water. 
We did it without creating any new permitting requirements and while maintaining all previous exemptions and exclusions. This was a rule a long time coming. Uh, the Supreme Court had issued some decisions which really, it's a pun we use all the time, but it, it, it had muddied the waters. And so this rule sets forth more bright lines so that we can more uh, uh, adequately water. EPA and the Corps actually added exclusions for features like artificial lakes and ponds, water filled depressions from construction, and grass swales. When agriculture and construction projects employ best management practices and are good stewards of water resources, this rule does not get in the way of those activities. Keep in mind that what the Clean Water Act does is make it illegal to pollute or destroy a protected water without a permit. The law only applies to water, not uplands, and normal farming practices continue to be excluded. So the rule makes clear which waters are covered and which ones are not based on the law and indeed the latest science. So here's what the rule does in a nutshell. Traditional navigable waters like rivers and lakes, interstate waters and territorial seas are covered. That has always been the case. EPA has provided certainty on how far safeguards extend to nearby waters. The rule sets physical measurable limits on covering nearby waters for the first time. And we have set limits on areas where case-by-case -case decisions are needed. So there's more certainty about what's in and what's out. The bottom line is this. If you didn't need a permit before this rule, you won't need a permit after, one, after the rule. Now, you may have heard that this rule is stayed pending the outcome of litigation. Regulatory initiatives of this type are typically subject to judicial challenge, so stay tuned for developments. So uh, many, many organizations and states have filed a challenge uh, on, on this rule, and we won't know the details of their claims until the briefing process begins. So it actually, you begin this litigation with a paragraph. I used to do it all the time in the acid rain days, suing the federal government when I had my state hat on. So uh, when the briefing process starts, we will see what the arguments are in more detail. The second rule that I'd like to mention, which you probably know about, is the Clean Power Rule. It was issued just Friday, and indeed the one paragraph uh, uh, claims have been filed, so we'll see in more detail what those claims are as the briefing process moves forward. This rule sets the first ever national standards requiring power plants to reduce carbon pollution from smokestacks. It applies to new and existing fossil fuel power plants. Each state comes up with its own plan to achieve pollution reduction goals. And in 2030, when this rule is uh, in effect, it will result in a 30% reduction in carbon pollution from fossil fuel plants nationwide. This is equivalent to canceling out the annual emissions from two-thirds of all cars and trucks on the road today. We can't say that climate change alone causes extreme storms, but we know that the storms get more intense the warmer the water, and the water is certainly getting warmer. The need to reduce carbon emissions is clear, and the clean power rule does that. Extreme weather presents a challenge. For some areas, it may be drought. We're dealing with an awful situation in Puerto Rico right now. Some communities have water bans of up to 48 hours. It's a really tough situation on top of all the economic woes in Puerto Rico. So we're dealing with that at, at EPA. For some other areas, it may be uh, uh, you, you have to deal with runoff and flooding conditions. That sounds familiar for up here, right? These effects can reduce the quality of water and can damage the infrastructure that we use to transport and deliver water. After Superstorm Sandy affected drinking water and wastewater treatment plants on the East Coast, in, 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 after Superstorm Sandy affected these plants in October of 2012, EPA made nearly $95 million available to New York and New Jersey to help make drinking water systems more resilient to extreme weather. 
and EPA is working with states, local governments, and disaster recovery agencies to do the same in other states before a storm hits. We are helping them weave climate change into their decisions with climate resilience tools, such as scenario-based projection maps and guides for adaptation strategies, which will assist utilities to prepare for climate impacts. One tool I want to highlight is EPA's Climate Resilience Evaluation and Awareness Tool. It's called, and it's known as CREATE. So the CREATE program guides users through an intuitive planning process. It essentially integrates climate models into a sophisticated vulnerability assessment. It helps utilities evaluate possible climate change related threats such as flooding, drought, and water quality to their assets. It also walks utilities through adaptive measures that they can take to reduce these potential impacts. Now we're all in a challenging situation. EPA estimates, estimates that the United States needs $384 billion in drinking water infrastructure investment. And that's for maintenance, repairs, and replacement. And meanwhile, budgets have been tight at all levels of government, we know that, and it doesn't look like that situation is going to get any better anytime soon. So we are looking to integrate our work across the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. And we need new approaches to infrastructure, partnerships, and source water protection. The success of EPA's Drinking Water State Revolving Fund program is unparalleled. We've provided over $26 billion in financing to more than 10,000 projects since 1997. In New York State, the financing included $3.5 billion for 775 projects. The SRFs are more than direct loan programs. They're job creators and public health protectors, and we know that these investments pay hefty dividends. But we need to do more. To build on that success, we're working more closely than ever with states, other federal agencies, and the private sector to leverage new funding sources. Having said that about the SRF, I think you are aware that EPA carefully guards these taxpayer funds. And we are vigilant that these funds are invested in appropriate projects covered by the Clean Water Act. And we will continue to do that. And let's, of course, not forget about source water protection. The original Safe Drinking Water Act left out this crucial piece of the puzzle focusing only on the water that came out of our taps. But as the years went by, we realized that it's a lot cheaper to protect source water in the first place than to rely on expensive treatment on the back end alone. That's why the 1996 Safe Drinking Water Act amendments made sure that states assess their drinking water sources and the factors that threaten them. Every state completed that step over a decade ago, but not all of them took action, or enough actions, based on that information. So we certainly need to go further. And all of us can take some action. Utilities can partner with landowners and businesses and make sure they prioritize actions to protect our water supplies. Local governments can help with land use planning to protect water where it counts the most. States can help update source water assessments and act on them to address the greatest threats to their drinking water. One management option involves regulations such as prohibiting or restricting land uses that might release contaminants in critical source water areas. So I'd like to move now and talk a little bit about the filtration avoidance determination, which I know is near and dear to many of your hearts, good or bad. We like to look at the good. As many of you know, since 1993, EPA and now the New York State Department of Health have issued a filtration avoidance determination called a FAD, F-A-D, to the city of New York under the Safe Drinking Water Act. 
So the general rule of the Safe Drinking Water Act is that drinking water requires filtration, you know, those systems require filtration before that water comes to your tap. The exception to this general rule is the FAD program. If a community can demonstrate that it can control potential pollution sources in its watershed, it can avoid the filtration requirement. So in addition to New York City, a number of other cities have filtration waivers. That includes Boston and San Francisco and also Syracuse to the west of us. Land acquisition remains a bedrock program that helps to preserve the natural environment in the Catskill, Delaware watershed and protect drinking water at the source. For close to 20 years, New York City has been offering to purchase land or easements from willing sellers in the watershed. New York City has also funded a farm easement program that is run by the Watershed Agricultural Council, which protects land from development and supports the farm community. Overall, the land acquisition program has protected more than 136,000 acres, or roughly 13% of the watershed, at a cost of $440 million. So combined with the large state land holdings in the Catskills and other preserved properties, about 37% of the Catskill Delaware watershed is now permanently protected. With the FAD, the city can avoid a filtration plant, provided that the city continues to show us and the state that progressive and vigilant successes are made in the, its protection of water at the source. So not having to build a filtration plant, of course, saves ratepayers the cost of billions of dollars. There's no question about that. But we know, those of us in this business, we know that these alternative investments are critical in reducing or reversing environmental degradation. So the current FAD is in effect until 2017. Now I've gone into some detail about the FAD because these good practices can be replicated on a smaller scale. It demonstrates to other communities the type of actions that can be taken to protect water resources. So I would like to move on to two more topics very briefly. The first one is EPA's Trash Free Waters effort. Uh, we're very focused on that, um, and I wonder if you are aware that 5 to 14 million tons of land-based trash enters our waters every year. Think about it. We are essentially landfilling our waters. Over the next 10 years, pollution from land could contribute to a total of one pound of plastic to every three pounds of fish in the world's oceans. Microplastics are another scourge to our marine environments. And they occur when you've got larger plastic items that are broken down by wave action or by the sun, and then they get into the food chain. Okay? And I'm sure that many of you have heard about microbeads. Those are a form of microplastics. They're found in personal care products. And for the most part, they can't be treated by wastewater treatment plants, at least not now with the current technology. This means that they remain in our waters and they get into the food chain. And so when consumers want to play a role and not buy products that are, have microbeads in them, you look at the labels and it's not so easy. You have to look for the terms polyethylene and polypropylene, and then you can put it back on the shelf. Sometimes you may see some terms like biodegradable beads. Don't be, don't be fooled about that. It may be misleading because they may not actually degrade. So this is a daunting problem that the business community, the public, and all levels of government need to work together to address. And of course, we all know this, but the best way to remove trash from our waters is to keep it from entering the waste stream in the first place. So we need to look at the source. And so we're trying to do that at EPA by bringing together a really fabulous group of stakeholders. And I know that some of you in the room today are part of that effort. We invite others of you to join us. If you Google EPA Trash Free Waters, you will, you will see what we're up to. 
so we bring together the stakeholders and really, you know, really wonderful groups that ordinarily may not interact with each other and to see the energy in the room and in uh, the work groups that I'll touch on in a moment, um, it's really pretty fabulous. And they're trying to come up with projects that will move the trash-free water effort forward. And so at the inaugural stakeholders uh, meeting this year, the group decided to establish work groups centered around PB5. And uh, Judith Ang says, it sounds like a British spy agency. And uh, I say it's, it's, it's the five plastics. So to me, it sounds like a 1960s uh, music group. But um, they address single-use plastics. So the, the first one are plastic bottles, of course, right? Plastic bags, takeout food boxes, micro beads and other microplastics, and cigarette butts. And so uh, the work groups are charged with creating short-term, achievable, and measurable projects. And so the goal of the group is to have zero trash loading to surface waters within 10 years, which we know will reduce impacts on wildlife, human health, recreation, and the monies needed to clean up this mess. Uh, so finally, I would like to address the EPA Water Sense program. And again, uh, Janice Whitney is our Water Sense coordinator, and please visit her table outside. Um, it's a national voluntary effort designed to reduce indoor and outdoor water use across the country. And water efficiency can stretch our limited water supplies by further reducing the need for expensive water supply infrastructure investments. And with the help and dedication of our partners, we've helped consumers save more than one trillion gallons of water and nearly $22 billion on water and energy utility bills. The program also helps minimize health risks associated with water pollution. When reservoir water levels get lower and groundwater tables drop, water supplies, human health, and the environment are put at serious risk. For example, lower water levels can contribute to higher concentrations of natural and human pollutants. Less water going down the drain means more water available in the lakes, rivers, and streams that we count on for recreation and for wildlife to survive. In addition, the Water Sense program reduces the amount of energy needed to treat wastewater, resulting in less energy demand and therefore less air pollution from these plants. So partnering with Water Sense really does just make sense. And today, here's the announcement, we want to welcome the Hudson River Watershed Alliance to our program. A big thank you for that. And we encourage other groups here to consider joining our partnership as well. So you can see that there are a lot of great water protection efforts going on. When we all work together, we can adapt to new circumstances and protect our most precious resource for our children and our communities. You all know better than anyone, protecting drinking water has never been easy, and it's certainly not getting easier, but when we focus on infrastructure investments, when we build partnerships and protect source water, we really do make a difference. So thank you so much for this platform for EPA.